all-time animes is Kentaro Miro's Berserk uh, series, which is an excellent anime surrounding a mythical medieval world where a common peasant named Griffith discovers a misshapen egg-like pendant called a baylet uh, that works very similarly to the Lament configuration in Clive Barker's Hellraiser series. And the pendant, which resembles a crimson egg adorned with various segments of human facial anatomy placed in random places on the egg, has the power to search out its rightful owner all by itself, uh, who is an individual selected by the gods of hell for appointment to the title of hellish royalty. Lordship over the denizens of hell, however, comes with a price. The young Griffith, who by sheer force of will catapults himself from his humble beginnings to eventually become the top military commander in all of the Kingdom of Midland, accomplishes several stunning victories against what was thought to be impregnable enemy strongholds. The King of Midland eventually confers noble status to Griffith and his top military brass, who together comprise the leaders of Griffith's army, the Band of the Hawk. A close relationship develops between Griffith and co-protagonist Guts, uh, who was a warrior of incredible strength and bravery, uh, but eventually Guts, against Griffith's wishes, leaves the Band of the Hawk and in a spectacular fall from grace, Griffith decides it a good idea to have a sexual rendezvous with the king's virgin daughter uh, in reaction to losing guts. This, of course, is a big no-no, compounded by the fact that the king also harbors some incestuous feelings towards his prized daughter. So, unsurprisingly, this lands the once revered Griffith a life sentence in the bowels of Midland's torture chambers, where the once ethereal military commander's tongue is cut out, his tendons are severed, and he is reduced uh, to a mere husk of a man, not resembling anything remotely human. Guts, having uh, taken a sabbatical and knowing none of this, returns to find the band of the Hawk in shambles, perpetually on the run from the king's forces. So a plan is hatched by Guts to break into Midland's castle to free Griffith and return the Band of the Hawk to its former glory in the process. Upon successfully infiltrating the tower, Guts and his comrades locate the torture chamber in which Griffith was being held and, to their horror, find an emaciated Griffith on the brink of death. Even still, they break him out and rescue Griffith where they bring him back to the Band of the Hawk, who predictably have their hopes for reformation dash when they see their leader in such a horrific state. And this is where it gets, well, very weird and very dark very fast. The emaciated Griffith's charm, the Baylet, who Griffith lost during his torture sessions, has ended up in a stream he was dumped into in a horse carriage accident after his rescue from the Band of the Hawk. Griffith, seeing his own reflection in the water uh, in the river that he was uh, dumped into, uh, tries to put himself out of, out of his misery by attempting to uh, commit suicide, by slitting his throat on a sharp protruding rock uh, that he found in the stream, but pathetically is unable to do so, uh, with his efforts resulting in a mere surface wound. So bloodied and desperate, Griffith then catches sight of this baylet floating downstream and he picks it up. In doing so, a small amount of blood from the gash in his neck from his earlier suicide attempt trickles onto the baylet, and when Griffith's blood comes into contact with this baylet, all hell literally uh, breaks loose. So, in the process of this, the band of the Hawk, having chased Griffith's runaway horse cart, finally catches up to him just in time to witness these turn of events triggered by the baylet. And then a giant eclipse then looms on the horizon, darkening the sky, which explodes and engulfs Griffith and the Band of the Hawk in the process, transporting them to an otherworldly alternate plane of existence where four demon gods of immense power emerge out of a hellish wall of faces to greet them. And amidst all the confusion and predictable panic that follows, they then, these gods, make Griffith an offer. And the offer is to sacrifice your Band of the Hawk, including his second-in-command, Guts, uh, and his best warrior, along with the only female soldier in the group, Casca. And this is the sacrifice that must be made in order for Griffith to ascend to a state of demonic godhood, and unfortunately for the Band of the Hawk, Griffith betrays them and accepts the offer, leaving the Band of the Hawk to fend for themselves against the minions of hell for his transition of hellish deification. And so one by one, the soldiers of the Band of the Hawk are then ritualistically slaughtered in a brutal blood rite that would make the mythical Molech blush. This bloodbath culminates in Griffith's re-emergence from a short period of hellish incubation as a winged, 
humanoid beast who then takes Casca, Guts's love interest, and subjects her to a horrific rape, inseminating her with his demonic seed, which corrupts the embryo already growing inside of her sired by Guts, predictably enraging Guts in the process. Now, despite considerable effort from the rampaging Guts, the minions of Hell now under Griffith's command manage to subdue him, pinning him down to the ground, and making Guts watch the entire ordeal from start to finish. Uh, now, a clip showing scenes from Berserk, including uh, uh, some of the uh, clips from the Eclipse, uh, is going to be provided in the description box. It's an excellent anime. At the very least, watch the anime if you don't have time to watch the entire manga. Uh, but, you know, if you do have time for the manga, I highly suggest just going straight forward to the manga and skipping the anime. It's just an incredibly brilliant series. Now, uh, observing this uh, process... One of the four original demon gods who takes the form of a winged woman, uh, a, a succubus figure, if you will, cackles with glee and states with what sounds like orgasmic pleasure the following words. She says, quote, How delicious. I feel it all over. I feel love. I feel hate. Ultimate pleasure. Ultimate pain. Life and death. All here to enjoy before our very eyes. The true nature of man and the devil is here and now, end quote. So, an extremely violent scene with this succubus-like creature reveling in the whole thing, just taking it all in and just embracing the violence and the sexual degeneracy unfolding before her eyes. Now, I know what my correct response should be to this scene, this scene of violence and torture and rape. I should have been horrified, I should have been disgusted, and I should have written it off as lowbrow anime shock porn. If I'm being honest with myself, however, I found this rape scene to be, well, amazing, right? I sat there, transfixed, and watched every amazing minute of that rape scene, and frankly, I wanted more of it by the end of it. So yes, you, you, you heard that correctly. I, a man, saw simulated acts of rape and came away with the distinct impression that I had liked what I watched and I wanted to explore my feelings about it in deeper detail. And I also wanted to consume more of this content. So with that said, I'm going to pause here and give the necessary disclaimers. I do not, under any circumstance, condone acts of violence or rape against anyone full stop. Rape is a horrific act of human degradation that should be punished to the fullest extent of the law, period. Anybody that suggests that I, in any way, shape, or form, am advocating actual rape will be immediately banned from this channel. Now, even with this disclaimer, the mere admission of an attraction towards simulated, simulated instances of violent sexual imagery makes me, a man, something akin to Satan incarnate, to feminists, to religious fundamentalists, to traditionalist conservatives, and likely every group or tribe in between. Wider society will deem this admission from a man as a type of sexual paraphilia, They'll speculate about what childhood trauma or issues with mommy or amygdala deficiencies I must be suffering from to arrive at such a deviant sexuality. The fact, however, is that human beings will cause traffic jams just to get a look at the scene of a horrific car crash. They will purposefully slow down to take in what they should be repulsed by. And the same, you know, housewives that regard a man such as myself as a monster for having these sexual proclivities, shelled out hundreds of millions of dollars worth of what was probably their husband's hard-earned cash to collectively propel sales of the book Fifty Shades of Grey into the stratosphere, with over 100 million copies sold at present. This is a book replete with rape fantasy and simulation, and acts of domination and submission, as well as hardcore BDSM. Feminists, of course, have no shortage of equivalent sexual deviants masquerading under the sex-positive feminist euphemism. A simple Reddit search of the words rape fantasy will return thousands of discussion threads full of both men and women attempting to understand their taboo sexual motivations surrounding rape. The implication being that we, as a species, likely are simultaneously repulsed by and attracted to sexual deviancy and violence. Now, in order to rectify these two conflicting patterns of thought, we do what we do best. We erect a taboo around it. And the creation of societal taboos serves several purposes. In creating them, we allow ourselves to forget the fact that we secretly, on some level, are attracted to that taboo. 
if it was horrific behavior and solely horrific behavior, then a taboo wouldn't be necessary in the first place, since very few people would engage in the behavior as a result of that. The taboo of rape does not exist because rape is bad and we need to be told this. It instead exists because rape is bad and we are absolutely engrossed and fascinated with it. The second function of the taboo is designed to ease our guilty conscience over our attraction to a taboo by allowing us to vilify other groups of people by accusing them and only them of harboring these deviant urges. I've seen many an atheist go as far back into history as the Old Testament, searching through the pages of Genesis, as it were, to find the genesis of our peculiar fascination with that which we should, by all accounts, immediately reject as repugnant and evil. In fact, an interesting website I came across in the aforementioned Reddit rape fantasy search uh, provided this WordPress article from a homeschooling blog titled Biblical erotica where the following arguments are made. The article says, quote, What happens when you give a sexually repressed kid a Bible? Many of our parents desperately wanted to protect us from what they saw as a culture of decadent sexual immorality. My parents' generation grew up in the free love 60s. While growing up, I often heard cautionary tales about that era. Yet who would have thought that if you isolate your children from sex in Hollywood movies, in all of those filthy TV shows, and you don't or barely teach them about sex, they will desperately seek out any information about it. It seems like a universal experience among homeschool alumni, digging through encyclopedias, dictionaries, and or anatomy books. There are many stories about inadequate or damaging sexual education from fundamentalist parents. But here's the kicker. When a child's only source of information about sexuality and sexual expression is the Bible, you get some um, remarkable results. Many young girls thought that they could literally get pregnant by laying next to a man. That's the King James Version for you. One area of intense shame and guilt from my childhood is my strange attraction to the sexual stories in the Bible. I always felt guilty because I would be aroused by sections of the Bible regarding violent sexual assault. For example, the rape of Tamar, the dismembering of a woman in Judges. Upon reflection, I realized that almost all of the graphic sexual stories in the Bible describe a sinful encounter, a violent act, or something like a harem of sex slaves that modern society tells us is unacceptable. And that's not even mentioning all of the offensive and dehumanizing sexual rules in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. With the exception of the Song of Solomon, if a couple engaged in edifying sex, there certainly wasn't graphic detail. It was usually he knew her or they lied together. In almost every case, the more detail, the more depraved the sexual act." End quote. Now, it's, it's really surprising to me that one can take the Bible, a book written by men, and see the actual Bible itself as the source of its ability to pervade the thoughts of youth thousands of years later with unclean thoughts of rape and violence and sodomy and incest. I see the fact that the Bible goes into lurid detail about non-consensual acts of violent sex while describing consensual sex within the confines of a loving marriage as simply the act of, quote, they lied together, as proof that we do have a troublesome fascination with these acts of depravity. And also written in the Bible is misdirection that I talked about earlier, taboo misdirection, and the blame game subtly pointing the finger away from one group toward the other. For it was God himself who used his divine rehypnol to keep the sanctity of motherhood intact, impregnating the Virgin Mary without burdening her with the guilt of adultery. This is called, as you know, the Immaculate Conception, which harkens back to the original human religion, that of the worship of the womb, the worship of the female. It goes back to the first religion, that of Lilith, and Ishtar, the religion of maternity. Think back to how our distant ancestors must have viewed motherhood, viewing the child literally issuing from the mother, not knowing when it would happen or why it would happen, or the role that fathers played in inseminating a woman to any accurate degree. They must have perceived this as a magical creation of life originating essentially from the anatomy of a female. This must have been our perception of female pregnancy for untold millennia during our Paleolithic and Neolithic existence. And it was those who practiced reverence to this religion that eventually passed on their genetics, right? Perhaps one can call it a proto-religion of sorts, to have seen these women creating these miniature human beings without the aid of modern science and understanding in a world where the elements and predators created a harsh existence surrounded by pain and death where every day was a struggle to keep alive, 
women issuing children, issuing life from their bodies, must have been a truly religious experience. Now, I'm sure, of course, that our preliterate ancestors had some ability to correlate reproduction and sex, uh, and the father's role in that, but the child issuing from the mother, and a lack of knowledge about what critical roles men played in the creation of his children, surely had a lasting psychological impact for our species, which was passed down to us, I'm sure, by biological natural selection, as well as cultural mimetics in the transmission of oral history. So this left us with a reverence for the female that lingers with us vestigially in the form of an inability, even today, for us to question the sanctity of female sexuality. Thus, any organic creative medium, video games, uh, for example, must by definition seek to divorce the fact that women are just as fascinated and just as drawn to sexual violence and taboo as men are. It is through this mechanism, among others, that the heart of feminist cries of sexism beats. It's our need to divert our fascination with taboo sexual imagery and subjects from women and point our finger at men. It is our attempt as a society, a gynocentric society, to project our collective and organic inclusion of things such as rape and violence and sex and everything taboo in our artwork and expression away from women. It is the same mentality that allowed the authors of the Bible to concoct their immaculate conception. Gamergate is our immaculate conception. So with all that said, you have to understand that the desire for those that create content in movies and books and video games or any other creative medium to evoke emotion from their viewers has been around since human beings developed the language to express these stories with and most likely before in more primitive forms. But it is only now with the advent of neuroscience and real-time fMRI analysis that we can begin to tease out what happens in the brain during scenes of visceral emotion, of violence, of tenderness, of love, of rape, etc. And this is in fact what a team of scientists is attempting to do, and an article posted on this very subject gives the breakdown below. This is an article titled, How Movies Trick Your Brain Into Empathizing with Characters. And this movie uh, starts talking first about the, uh, the movie Black Swan. And it says, quote, There's a scene near the end of Black Swan, and a video of this is going to be uh, in the description box, where Nina finally loses her grip on reality. Nina, played by Natalie Portman, is the protagonist of this 2010 psychological thriller, a ballerina stressed to the breaking point by competing with another dancer for a starring role. She begins to hallucinate black feathers poking through her skin, a sign she's becoming the part she's meant to play. When people watch the scene, their brain activity bears some resemblance to a pattern that's been observed in people with schizophrenia, said Talma Hendler, a neuroscientist at Tel Aviv University in Israel, at a recent event here sponsored by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. My suggestion to you, she says, is that as Nina is getting crazier and crazier, the audience experiences something like schizophrenia, Hendler said. Darren Aronofsky, who directed Black Swan, was on stage with Hendler, and he took this as a compliment. Aronofsky has a remarkable knack for putting his audience in the mindset of mentally unstable and anguished characters. Recall the tortured mathematician in Pi, or Mickey Rourke's battered wrestler, desperate for a comeback in The Wrestler. When asked if he was alarmed by the possibility of giving his audience a temporary taste of psychosis, Aronofsky responded, I'd be thrilled. Hendler studies the neural correlates of human emotion and their role in mental illness. Movies, she says, are a useful way to study how emotions fluctuate in real time and what's going on in the brain as that happens. Recently, her team has been investigating networks in the brain that appear to have a role in empathy. She's found evidence for two types of empathy, each tied to a different network of the brain's regions. One type she calls mental empathy, which requires you to mentally step outside yourself and think about what another person is thinking or experiencing. The other type she calls embodied empathy. This is the more visceral, in-the-moment empathy you might feel when you see someone get punched in the guts. Further down in the article it says, quote, At the Academy event, she presented fMRI brain scan data her team collected as subjects watched several emotional movie clips. One clip was from the 1998 drama The Stepmom, in which Susan Sarandon plays a divorced woman who's been diagnosed with terminal cancer. In this scene, she's talking to her son, telling him she'll always be looking out for him uh, from, from heaven because she's going to die soon, and it's very sad. 
Hendler played this clip along with a corresponding video that showed how subjects' brain activity was changing. This scene primarily engaged the mental empathy network, Hendler said, and on the screen, blue dots appeared representing parts of the frontal, temporal, and parietal cortex that make up this network. Blue lines connecting the blue dots, Hendler said, indicate that activity in these regions is coordinated, essentially that parts of this network are talking to each other a lot during the scene. In another emotional moment in this scene from the stepmom, the son tells his mother how much he loves her, and she hugs him. It's more touchy-feely, less cerebral. And there was a difference in the subject's brains, too. The blue dot had faded, and a network of green dots and lines had become conspicuous evidence. Hendler says that the embodied empathy network contributed more to the emotions subjects felt during this scene. Based on experiments in which people rate their own emotional state as they watch movie clips, Hendler concludes that both types of empathy can have a powerful influence on what people actually experience, end quote. I think that these extremely important developments in neuroscience are allowing us for the first time to, at the very least, attempt to differentiate what the triggers are for human emotion, and thus for different types of human emotion, putting one more brick in the giant constructive effort that is the deciphering of the human instruction manual. Right? In fact, I think these scientists are doing just that. The article further down says, quote, In the scene from Black Swan, despite Nina's viscerally disturbing actions, it's the blue mental empathy network that dominates with the green embodied empathy network flickering to life only occasionally. As, for example, when Nina pulls a feather from her back. It's this pattern, relying more heavily on the mental empathy network, even in the face of a visceral experience, that Hendler has seen in schizophrenia patients. It's as if they're having to think through the emotional impact of situations that other people grasp more intuitively and automatically, she said. Here's where things get a little tricky, though. The division of labor among different brain regions is never totally neat and clean. Each region has multiple jobs, and scientists don't necessarily know what all of them are. That makes it difficult to say with a high degree of confidence what a given region or network is doing whenever it lights up in an fMRI scan, end quote. Now, given this information, it is very possible that we will eventually uh, be able to determine not only how different groups of people react to images of extreme pornographic violence or rape scenes and why, and more importantly, I think we'll be able to discern how the different genders respond to this visceral stimuli, and in doing so, we will be able to view how, for example, women and men respond to these instances of sexual violence. So what we have created via the silver screen, via the video game console or the PC video game industry, is an opportunity to explore our deep, dark, visceral, and oftentimes violent desires without consequence. We want to murder in video games because we're a violent ape that likes to murder. We also happen to be an animal that has the capacity to erect civilization, which is a giant, complex survival mechanism and human sanctuary against the wilds of nature and the elements, as well as our own not-so-civilized instincts. Meaning that civilization is, relative to nature, an illusory construct that we must all invest in in order to enjoy the luxuries that civilization affords us. A great many qualities of civilization are not real in any meaningful way, but our belief in the illusory parts of civilization eventually manifest in real ways. We have currency made of worthless or almost worthless coins and paper that hold really no intrinsic value, yet we all pretend that they do have value. And in doing so, we create massively complex economies that disperse resources to the maximum amount of people, ensuring the safety and survival of the maximum amount of the members of our species. We create things like human rights, which are basically entitlements that we all agree to adhere to that simply would not exist in the Neolithic or the Paleolithic, where essentially whoever could kill whoever else the most enjoyed the most luxurious lifestyle. So in that sense, civilization is nothing really but globalism in the form of the inclusion of all the diverse peoples of the world into one giant tribe where all are afforded luxuries called rights that ensure to some degree that they should not be killed, that they should not be stolen from, that they should not be unjustly imprisoned, etc. But these rights do not exist in any tangible sense. Our belief in these rights, and solely our belief in these rights, is the only thing that allows us to build things like robust legal systems designed to protect all of us with basic human rights, but they are, without a doubt, 
mental constructs of the human species infallible and increasingly likely to fail as the belief in these intangible constructs of civilization wanes. The process of investing in these mental constructs necessitates that the human being leave behind what are oftentimes primitive needs and drives and urges, and the repression of primitive needs and drives is an unhealthy state for the human animal, and thus the human animal will search out a means by which it can express those primitive drives in another way. Clearly, our investment as a species in civilization was more than worth it since, uh, amongst many, many other benefits, the technological advancements that organized civilization has helped us to achieve has provided to us a virtual world that is increasingly bordering on photorealism that allows us then to indulge these primitive drives that are often admittedly violent without the consequences of visiting violence onto others in the real world. If there's any thought or doubt as to whether or not human beings will actually take it there, and explore these violent uh, urges, one only need look at the Roman Colosseum, where people were killed for sport. One only need uh, to find cultural works such as The Most Dangerous Game, which, you know, is, is one of humanity's most famous uh, uh, short stories. Thus, when we want to explore how taking an AK-47 and shooting into a crowd of people might make us feel, we can do this in a virtual way on a video game. We can sink down to Caligula level depravity in a video game and also know that it isn't real. Those of you that are gamers perhaps remember the days of the original Resident Evil installments with their, their, their pre-rendered walkthroughs and perhaps also you remember the terror you felt when a canine zombie or, or a liquor, if you guys remember those, jumped through a mansion window and attacked you. Do you remember physically jumping out of your seat? I do, and human beings love to feel that. They love to feel that primitive uh, uh, existential threat, even if it's simulated on a TV screen. And video games have for a long time now simulated the, that host of, of lizard-brained fight-or-flight responses and are even, with the advent of virtual reality, simulating reality so effectively that they recreate feelings of, of motion sickness or, or nausea or vertigo. But it's a lot more nuanced emotions, right? The higher brain stuff, complex emotions like envy or guilt or shame that gaming is now currently allowing us to experience. And that's the really interesting part, right? This virtual medium is allowing us now to experience reality, if you will, outside of reality. Not only is the virtual medium eliciting physical phenomenon that previously only the outside environment could summon out of us, but a game, for example, like Mass Effect has developed a multifaceted approach to virtual morality, if you want to call it that. And this is a game where your actions are framed within a moral system judged by external narrators, where your actions via a rating system build up a reputation of being a renegade or a paragon based on whether or not you do evil or bad things within the game. But even more so than this, the player is confronted with situations that can in fact, and this is the interesting part, elicit natural human emotions, complex human emotions such as guilt. You see, that's the beautiful thing about video games. Instances like, for example, when I was playing Mass Effect and I had to decide whether or not to kill the sentient insectoid species known as the Rachni. Now, the Rachni were a race of intelligent alien insects or arachnids that communicated via a hive-minded form of telepathy in which a queen rachni would control her offspring telepathically, and this species was intelligent and sentient, and you, Commander Shepard, are given the choice of killing the last rachni queen, dooming this species, this, this intelligent species, to extinction in the process, or allowing her to live. And this, of course, is a moral conundrum, right? We have never had to confront this as human beings because no other life form we know of can match our degree of sentience. But there are inklings of this dilemma in our consciousness, right? This, this, this dilemma of, of having to enslave a sentient species, right? It's why we protest SeaWorld, for example, because we do not like to see, uh, at the very least, semi-sentient cetaceans, for example, uh, whales and dolphins, uh, killer whales and dolphins, used and abused for our mere entertainment. But imagine instead the increased ramifications of having the choice to purposely bring about the extinction of a species as sentient as us, if not more so, the fictional Rachni in this example. Doing this would amount to a crime against sentience. And as human beings, it's not our bodies, right? Our human bodies that we prize 
and and we elevate above uh, the rest of our, the animal kingdom. It is our minds, it is our consciousness, it is our sentience. So that's what we prize as human beings. So again, this would be a crime against sentience, the equivalent of a crime against humanity, right? We see ourselves as human beings. These would be instead insectoid or arachnid beings with all the rights and freedoms we reserve for sentient animals such as ourselves. I mean, e even now in the real world, forget about this fictional video game universe, we are asking ourselves whether chimpanzees have fundamental uh, human rights because of their ability to, to at least come close or approach the same sentient abilities of human beings. Of course, there's a huge disparity, but you know that they're the closest that we have in the animal kingdom besides us to breaking that barrier of sentience. So if we discover alien life and we have the choice then to either eliminate a species that is sentient, then this can absolutely 100% be said to be an act of genocide to exterminate a species that is capable of the same sort of thought and reflection and consciousness that we are capable of. So again, in Mass Effect, you are charged as Commander Shepard with either killing or allowing to survive the queen of this intelligent insectoid species that, just like you, is capable not only of thought, but of achieving cross-species communication with humans, and you are tasked with either killing it, the last of our species, or allowing it to live and continue on reproducing its kind. Now, you have no reason to suspect that this individual member of that species would at some future point wage war against humanity because this member of the species, according to the storyline, when the Rachni were warring against humanity, had merely been an egg that was not responsible for waging war. It was not responsible for any crimes whatsoever. And yet, personally, I still decided to kill off the last member of this ancient species of insectoid sentient creatures. And when I did so, I have to say that I actually... You know, I actually did feel something. I actually did experience some guilt after having wiped a sentient species off the face of existence, at least in the virtual medium. And that's the great thing about video games. That is that it allows us to explore how we feel about engaging in potentially despicable or morally reprehensible behavior. So this is the new manifestation of the advancement of video games the creativity that video games bring to the human experience in allowing us to confront realities we can't possibly experience without testing it in the real world on real people, taking on real, long-lasting, permanent guilt and legal penalties in the process that would come with shooting somebody or raping somebody or what have you. That is the value of gaming, or at least some of the value of gaming. And, you know, to be clear, I'm not even saying that the vast majority of people are just walking around itching to find out how they would feel after raping or murdering somebody. It doesn't work that way, right? It's more of a subconscious thing that it's, it's more of a curiosity that we just want to experience because we have made now with this technology the opportunity for us to feel these things to see how we would react after shooting a bunch of virtual people or mowing down 20 or 30 people in your car in Grand Theft Auto all under the auspices of escapism. And we just want to see how we feel doing these things that we will never go about doing in real life, in the real world. A basic rule of humanity is that we, as a species, we seek to experience more often than not. We are an experiential species. We take drugs because we are experiential. We go skydiving because we are experiential. And we are always interested in engaging our feelings regarding new experiences. This is the nature of the human animal, and it certainly isn't going to be different with the invention of virtual reality. We as human beings wanted to know how it would feel to jump out of an airplane and accelerate toward the Earth until we're traveling at free fall speed without the obvious consequence of dying on impact with the Earth. Thus, we created the parachute. Video games are the same way. So this is the trend that we're going to see more and more of moving into the future. Video game developers that wish to use increasing computational ability to render photorealistic immersion with things like virtual reality and augmented reality, but knowing that also simple visual reality isn't enough, that perhaps even more important is multi-sensory and emotional immersion. Even more important is the ability for the video game developer to make you, the gamer, perceive your virtual feelings in response to a virtual reality and virtual stimulus in a way that is indistinguishable or as close to indistinguishable as possible to how you perceive your feelings in actual reality in reaction to actual stimulus. 
Now, the excellent uh, 2013 survival horror game, uh, The Forest, is a great example of this. And here's an article called uh, uh, The Forest, Survival Horror and the Guilt of Killing. All these are going to be in the description box uh, for your reference, just in case you want to check them out yourselves. But now in this article, the game's creators discuss the premise of the game, which is that of a, a sandbox environment, uh, a lot like Grand Theft Auto in that respect, where the player is confronted with the situation of being stranded in an open world forest with cannibalistic natives that while cannibalistic for survival, generally will leave you, the protagonist, alone, granted you don't interfere with them hunting for food or steal their possessions, etc. They are, just like you, simply trying to survive for the most part. So the article says of the cannibals that inhabit the forest, quote, much of the fear factor comes from those AI threads in the form of cannibalistic humanoid mutants that live and breathe in the game's world, hunting the same animals you hunt, foraging the same plants, and seeing you as an unwelcome guest in their habitat. As nocturnal creatures, you're largely safe from their curiosity during the daylight hours, giving you time to improve your stamina and health through exercise and to build yourself shelter using materials and tools you create yourself. But at night, it's a completely different story. Far from the mindless killing machines, mutants do not wake up and decide to instantly go out and hunt for you. In fact, they will not even know of your existence unless your paths cross and conflict ensues over territorial and or resource disputes. Kill an animal that they're hunting and take it home for yourself and you can expect retaliation. And later on in the article, it says, quote, More than that, though, they, referring to the cannibals, feel sad when one of their comrades die, and they will try to drag an injured friend to safety and away from you if you're attacking them. You begin to understand that they do actually have their own feelings and aren't just zombie-like evil creatures, even though they do want to eat you. So I love how the developers of the game uh, try to impart this this human characteristic, the characteristic of uh, a desire for ceremonial burial on these cannibalistic creatures, right? Uh, when you do end up getting into a scuffle with one of these forest inhabitants, the creators of the game had this to say about the ordeal. They say, quote, They're very hard to kill, and you have to be very violent to kill them, Falcone continues. Falcone is one of the creators of the game, by the way. He says, in lots of games, you can shoot someone in the leg four times and they die instantly, or you hit them with a stick and then they die. In our game, you hit them with a stick to make them fall over, and then you get a rock and you hit them over the head three or four times in order to kill them. On the surface of it, that may sound like mindless and gratuitous violence of the sort that video games are historically admonished for, but Falcone sees it differently. He says, quote, we really want to get across that it's very difficult to actually kill someone, and we want each kill the player performs to be something they feel some guilt about. What we don't want is just mindless killing, end quote. So in other words, the creators of this game are seeking to make you commit to murder. Virtual murder, of course, but even still. They would like for you to have to work hard to extinguish a virtual life, and they want to create an environment where the player can perhaps, despite the violence of the cannibals, perceive them as much like himself, eking out an existence in this forest, trying to survive day by day, just like him. And this has a humanizing effect on the mind of the gamer, which needs to be repressed every time you want to, you want to cross that barrier of having to kill one of the cannibals. Now, this same type of dilemma was posed in another uh, very interesting article titled, quote, Why don't we feel guilty in video games? where the author says of asking the actual player in the game to feel guilt, quote, Asking a player to feel guilt and recognizing the consequences of that guilt in gameplay form is much more rare. Action-adventure games tend to be linear, both in environmental and narrative terms. They point forwards. Mechanically speaking, guilt is essentially retroactive morality. How can that work in a video game challenge system? This is potentially a big problem for designers hoping to create narrative experiences of true depth and meaning. Guilt is, after all, a defining human trait. For some of us, it is a sort of residual, a background hum. Guilt is emotional tinnitus. Whenever I'm idle for a few minutes, I have this Microsoft paperclip style voice in my head saying, I see you are trying to relax. Can I present you with some of the dumb shit you've done today? And then I think about not kissing my kids goodbye that morning because I was angry with them, or that hour I spent trying to land a helicopter on the top of a moving truck in Grand Theft Auto when I should have been writing something. Or I think of people I've hurt, or not been in contact with, or have let down. It spirals outwards and forever, a universe of guilt 
lit by vast supernovas of self-recrimination. And then he says, I can remember a handful of times I felt truly guilty in games, and it has been extremely powerful. In the psychological horror adventure Heavy Rain, which is an excellent game by the way, lead character Ethan is given a series of tasks by the unknown murderer who has kidnapped his son. One of them is to kill a low-life drug dealer, but just as the player is set to pull the trigger, the dealer reveals that he has children, and that he's desperate, and that he's human. What do you do? I shot him, but felt bad about it, and my guilt was unconnected to the in-game ram ramifications. So again, we see a desire to put the player in a situation that requires him to make a tough choice with a virtual life hanging in the balance. We see this emotional immersion taking place, and games such as Mass Effect or Heavy Rain are extremely successful games. With high reviews, these games are critically acclaimed. They are quality gaming experiences, meaning that to the consumer, it is extremely important to have these dynamics available to them in their gaming experience, and that, not sexism, not misogyny, but that is why Anita Sarkeesian and feminists like her have earned the backlash that they have. Because they get up on their high horse and try to get game developers to censor what they perceive as sexism to the detriment of the quality of the games and the emotional immersion that the game provides when it asks you to kill somebody or in the case of Grand Theft Auto, to purchase the services of a prostitute and then beat her to death and steal your money back afterwards. Do I want to actually do this in real life because I've done it in Grand Theft Auto? Of course not, that's ridiculous. But I do want the option to do this in the virtual video game without feminists like Anita Sarkeesian screaming bloody murder about it. You bet I do. I don't like racism, but when watching The Sopranos, I think that it lends a bit of authenticity to Tony Soprano when he does have racism sentiments. Thus, if Tony doesn't like black or Hispanic people, I don't have a conniption fit and cried racism and try to get the authors to write it out of the story because including it in the story lends to the realism of the Sopranos. I mean, is it really that offensive or shocking to people that an Italian mob boss might have some racist sentiments? Is it that absurd to you, Anita Sarkeesian, that a video game character could potentially have sexist sentiments or a less than stellar view of women? or of men for that matter. You see, what feminists like Anita Sarkeesian fail to realize is that interesting and compelling people and characters are interesting and compelling sometimes due in part to the fact that they have flaws, that you can't fit into one of your pretty, neat little egalitarian boxes. What feminists like Anita Sarkeesian fail to realize is that human beings are nuanced, multifaceted creatures that have prejudice and that generalize and that's not always right but if the task of a video game is along with entertainment to confer realism and to immerse the player in its interactive world then i want to see some flawed potentially racist or potentially sexist character traits present in imperfect flawed characters i want to see these flaws in fictional characters just as much as I want to see characteristics that provide some measure of redemption, some good, some ability to overcome his or her prejudice. But I want to see his or her prejudice. And I don't want the sanitized bullshit that Anita Sarkeesian is trying to peddle, or should I say force, onto the gaming industry. You see, Anita Sarkeesian, it's you. It's you and your merry band of feminists who see a problem with the gaming industry everywhere you look. It's you that's the real problem. You're the problem with the gaming industry. Not supposed sexism, it's you. It's you and your holier-than-thou moral posturizing. It's you and your modern-day book-burning campaign. It's you and your propaganda, and it's not just you. It's you and essentially any and everybody that wants to impose its morality on a virtual free market of ideas. That's what video gaming is, a virtual free market of ideas. Allow the free market to work. It's people like you, Anita Sarkeesian, that made a giant stink about the Tomb Raider rape scene, for example, or attempted rape scene, right? And let's explore then a bit of your ilk's handiwork then, shall we? Here's an article titled, Tomb Raider creators are no longer referring to games attempted rape scene as an attempted rape scene. And this is from the infamous Kotaku, and the article says, quote, the creators of the new Tomb Raider have denied that their new game features a, quote, attempted rape scene, directly contradicting their own statements to Kotaku last week. Addressing the widespread reactions to the article posted on this site Monday, Crystal Dynamics studio head Daryl Gallagher released a statement today saying that there is no rape attempt against Tomb Raider hero Lara Croft in the scene shown in their Crossroads trailer. 
One of the character defining moments for Lara in the game, which has incorrectly been referred to as an attempted rape scene, is the content we showed at this year's E3, and which over a million people have now seen in our recent trailer entitled Crossroads, Gallagher wrote. This is where Laura is forced to kill another human being for the first time. In this particular selection, while there is a threatening undertone in the sequence and surrounding drama, it never goes any further than the scenes that we have already shown publicly. Sexual assault of any kind is categorically not a theme that we cover in this game. Now, now this is the Kotaku uh, author speaking. He says, This directly contradicts a statement made from Crystal Dynamics executive producer Ron Rosenberg to Kotaku last week in Los Angeles. Here's the relevant transcript from that interview. Ron says, quote, And then what happens is the best friend gets kidnapped and she gets taken prisoner by scavengers on the island. They try to rape her and, and then Kotaku chimes in and says they try to rape her, and Ron says she's literally turned into a cornered animal, and that's a huge step in her evolution. She's either forced to fight back or die, and that's what we're showing today, end quote. Now, I, I saw this attempted rape scene, and I'm going to have it in the description box for you. It shows Lara Croft attempting to escape the rape scene, successfully, I might add. So... The question I want to pose to feminists like Anita Sarkeesian is, is it more important to you that in a game that is at least attempting to give a backstory to an extremely violent woman who puts herself in extremely dangerous situations in pursuit of archaeological relics, is it so incredibly unbelievable to you that she would end up in a dangerous situation involving an attempted rape? Is it that out of the realm of possibility that this could happen? And if so, is it wrong to use that scenario to confer realism and authenticity to her character? Or is it more important to you feminists and your brigade of censors that the realism be left out of the game if it hurts your delicate sensibilities? If you watch this, Anita Sarkeesian, you do know that Punisher's entire family was murdered by mobsters. You do know that in Berserk that I mentioned earlier, Guts was born while his own mother was hanging from a tree, dead. You do know that Guts himself was raped. Not, not even attempted rape, but full-on raped by another man. You do know Goku's entire planet and his race was exterminated by Frieza. Should we have, in the name of sanitizing video games, excluded these integral plot points out of our most beloved comics and mangas because feminists said so? Or are women like you, Anita Sarkeesian, concerned not with the depiction of sexual violence in gaming and comics, but instead only with sexual violence against women? Hold on to that thought, because, you know, we're going to come back to that in a bit. But for now, I do want to emphasize that this desire for the censorship and sanitization of comics and video games is not solely relegated to feminist dogma, but it rears its ugly head just as easily in right-wing circles. Take, for example, an article that I stumbled on titled, Grand Theft Auto, How Male Avatars Are, Quote, Virtually Raping Women. And the article starts out by saying this. A disturbing new trend sees video game users modifying code in Grand Theft Auto so they can quote, sexually assault female characters before sharing the videos on YouTube, Radhika Sangani reports, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Grand Theft Auto players are now able to act out virtual rape on avatars by rewriting the game's code. Many of the players are then sharing the trolling videos as they call them on YouTube. Those doing it are known as mods because they modify the game's code. Many are choosing to change their characters into naked men who are then given invincible powers. This means that they can physically latch on to other avatars and simulate sex, playing an animation that thrusts their pelvis back and forth. The victim is unable to get away. One Reddit user, Mr. Eric Matilla, wrote about being, quote, virtually raped on GTA and said he would run up to you slowly and sensually and then rape you. Then, when he was done, he would be stuck behind you no matter what. Worst part is, he could not be killed, end quote. This modifying of the game, she says, is being done to uh, Grand Theft Auto on the PlayStation 3, where players can connect online and play games with friends and strangers. The videos being posted on YouTube are too inappropriate to be reproduced here, but they mostly show nude male avatars attacking female avatars. On Reddit, users seem to find the disturbing trend funny. Some have replied to Mr. Eric Matilla with comments such as, Quote, this is one of the most funny mods I have ever heard of and definitely want to see it in action. Ha ha. And that's amazing. One wrote, quote, the best part is the game won't recognize it as a crime, so no stars or penalties. End quote. Now, this led me to do some research on the controversial question of how evil should we allow video games to be? What can we allow in video games? 
Well, we allow violent murder, we allow genocide, but we can't allow rape? Why? Why is genocide okay, but rape not? Why in Mass Effect 3 is Commander Shepard allowed to persuade a cure for the Krogan genophage to not be allowed to see the light of day, potentially dooming them to extinction in the process? Why is the destruction of entire races of sentient life okay, but not rape? Well, you know, that could be the topic of another video entirely. But it has its origins in the gynocentric tendencies of our species, and it is amplified further by feminist technology. Rape is a psychological barrier that our species dare not cross even in the virtual medium, even though objectively speaking, murder and genocide are much worse crimes, and we do tolerate those in video games. Uh, in our current climate of rape hysteria, it's the taboo, Voldemort-like topic that we refuse to acknowledge openly, even though we all know it's there somewhere taped onto our DNA and littered throughout our history from the Neolithic to the Mongolian steppe to the last days of the Third Reich at Stalingrad. Again, civilization and the luxuries we call rights and liberties are innovations that we've developed to drastically reduce the incidence of things like rape, and yet still, even with rape at an all-time low, our hyperfixation on it remains. And with that said, I want to direct you to an article, not from a feminist source, but an article titled, and the title appears to have been posed uh, not as a statement, but as a question, uh, given the question mark icons, uh, titled, We Should Be Able to Rape Girls in Video Games, The Morality of Grand Theft Auto. And this is posted, again, not from a feminist source, but instead on conservativeread.com, and the author is a gentleman named Caleb Bonham, who has graciously allowed me to use his video clip associated with this article. But before I do play that video, let me first read to you uh, the article in its entirety. It says, quote, As the entertainment industry continues to embrace mankind's deepest, darkest, most vile fantasies, will you support it? A number of students at Colorado State University said this week they were all for the violence and misogyny depicted in Grand Theft Auto uh, four, a game that crossed the $1 billion sales mark within just three days of its release, according to Reuters. In Grand Theft Auto 4, you can hire a prostitute, have sex with the prostitute, and as she gets out of your car, you can kill her and get your money back. Do you think that is acceptable? And that's the question that he was posing to the students on the, on the uh, university campus. And the students responded by saying, quote, the video game isn't a representation of real life, said one of the students. It's like a fantasy. Then uh, Bonham says, what is the difference morally between the prostitute scenario and a video game that allows the gamer to rape women? When juxtaposed, will students see the filth behind the commercially successful video game franchise? And that's the end of that article. So, okay. Now we're going to go to the video, which shows uh, Mr. Bonham conducting these interviews on campus. And I'll play some of the video clips of that now. In Grand Theft Auto V, you can hire a prostitute. You can have sex with a prostitute. And as she gets out of your car, you can kill her and get your money back. Do you think that is acceptable? Yes, I do. In Grand Theft Auto V, why can you not rape a woman? Uh, I don't know. I feel like rape's a little, like, next level. Uh like what is the difference? Game? What is the difference between virtually raping a woman and maybe having sex with a prostitute, gunning her down, and getting your money back? What is the moral difference in the virtual reality? Nothing. So we should be able to rape people in Grand Theft Auto then. You think so? Yeah, why not? We should be allowed to rape girls in Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> Video game violence started with a frog trying to cross the street. But the video game industry has evolved into one that embraces mankind's deepest, darkest, most vile fantasy. Okay, so here we see the interesting question posed to these people, and Caleb rightly unveils the hypocrisy surrounding the act of rape in video games, that is, that we allow killing and murder of prostitutes, but not rape. Right? The students, as you will see, have a very hard time explaining why one is okay and not the other. And the reason they have a hard time explaining it is because there's no reason to allow one and not the other. Yes, if we allow mass murder and other forms of violence in video games, we should allow rape in video games. Caleb then writes in a segue on the video that, quote, As long as the entertainment industry glorifies violence against women, cops, and ordinary citizens, he will speak out, end quote. 
Now, the problem with this statement is that the entertainment industry does not glorify any of these forms of violence. It doesn't glorify anything. It simply makes the potential to engage in or consume this virtual violence available to the consumer, at least in, in Grand Theft Auto's case, and then the consumer shells out, in Grand Theft Auto's case, over a billion dollars worldwide in order to get the chance to virtually engage in this virtual violence. What Caleb is trying to do is, is to try to correct human nature in a context of this expression of human nature not translating to any harm or violence against actual human beings in the real world, a feat which is damn near impossible as far as I'm concerned. In Grand Theft Auto V, uh, you can uh, hire a prostitute. Uh, you can have sex and pay the prostitute, uh, and then as she gets out of the car, you can run her over and get your money back. Do you think that's acceptable in a video game? The video game isn't a, a representation of real life. It's like a fantasy. Do you think that the moral debauchery that is depicted in Grand Theft Auto V is acceptable in a video game? Why not? Why not? Why not? So in Grand Theft Auto V, yeah. you can murder all of the cops that are trying to arrest you. Do you think that's acceptable in a video game? Uh, yeah. Why? Because they're not real cops. It's not real? Yeah. Is there such a thing as virtual morality? And where is that line drawn? With the release of Grand Theft Auto V, a game that offers painfully realistic depictions of topless strip clubs, public sex, real life tragedies like cop killings, and a disturbing torture scene in which you tug out a victim's teeth with pliers. The only thing missing from Grand Theft Auto V seems to be the user's ability to rape somebody. What is the difference, morally, in playing a video game that allows you to murder all of the cops that are trying to arrest you and a video game that maybe allows you to rape a woman? Um, I guess not really much difference. So do you think that it would be okay to have a video game that allowed you to rape a woman? No. But do you think it's okay for a video game to allow you to buy a prostitute, then run her over, kill her, and get your money back? When you put it that way, no. no. I guess I didn't think of it that way. I, never did I just either. thought of it as a video game. You know, well, that's a good question. Uh, hopefully, and this is just a hope, but people would see that that kind of draws a line. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that that's just not... The line is drawn in killing prostitutes. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? Seriously, I don't know. I don't know. It should be way before that. I don't know how to answer that question. Um... I, I mean, I, I, want, I think developers still have a line that they follow. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think they would include rape just because it's a very sensitive subject. And, you know, killing, you know, prostitutes is still a sensitive subject. But you see, I don't know how I really put that in words. So why does society see a difference? Because I think society overwhelmingly would object to a video game that allowed you to rape a woman. Mm -hmm. But society welcomes and embraces a video game that is based on pretty much every element of crime besides that. Hmm. That is a good point. The entertainment industry is feeding off of the demons that lurk in people's hearts. And my question for you is where is society heading? Do you see society moving in the direction of banning video games such as Grand Theft Auto V? Not through the government, not through any regulation, but by the free market, by saying, no, I am not going to purchase that video game. Or do you see society is moving in the direction of allowing for rape in a video game? I see society moving in the direction of allowing rape in video games. Probably the rape one one if we're moving towards all the <laughs> Grand Theft Auto, you know. Which direction are video games going? Are we moving closer towards uh, allowing rape in video games or are we moving uh, further away from that? I'd say we're definitely getting closer. I mean, the more and more you allow different things into games and mo even movies to that extent, I mean, the more acceptable it becomes in society to put them in those things. So I think as one step goes, it'll push another step and eventually it just kind of gets numbed, I think. So eventually you just decide that it doesn't really matter. It's just a game. But again, I do think it does pour into real life and the decisions you may make. Society has embraced the virtual moral debauchery that is depicted in Grand Theft Auto V to the sum of over a billion dollars in sales in its first three days. A milestone reached faster than any entertainment property in history. See, members of the left argue that morality is subjective. I disagree. There is such a thing as virtual morality, and the line of what is morally acceptable is going to continue to evolve 
unless you take a stand. Our world is becoming increasingly reliant upon technology and virtual reality. Where do you draw your line? So now here, uh, Caleb poses the question of whether or not there is such a thing as virtual morality. And my answer to this question is no. No, there's not such a thing as virtual morality because there's not such a thing as morality, period. Morality is a blanket term that us human beings ascribe to our efforts to corral human behavior into a loose consensus of acceptable behavior. At best, this blanket term, this morality, functions as a barometer for appropriate human behavior that makes living amongst each other easier. At worst, this morality functions as a tool that is used to oppress creativity and to censor unpopular opinion. Morality, especially in terms of video games and virtual environments, is even more of a loose descriptor in the virtual medium and it becomes more and more fleeting as the fact that no actual physical damage to actual human beings is taking place in the virtual world becomes apparent. Now, I've seen interesting articles summing up the prospect of virtual reality being used by governments in real-world torture in conjunction with things like hallucinogens in order to simulate terror in the real world, and that would indeed beg the question of virtual morality, but only because it translates to real-world harm to other human beings. Now, I've never understood the conservative fixation on things like censoring video games if they show, for example, topless dancers or public sex scenes, since it wasn't video games that brought these things about. And they know this. Humans had topless bars before video games existed. The presence of them in video games is a result of the human condition, not a change of it following the advent of virtual reality and video games. Now after this, the video continues and you see more of these college students stutter and stammer their way through the question Caleb poses to them, unable to find an answer to the okay to kill prostitutes but not okay to rape them dilemma. And this stuttering and stammering isn't for lack of knowledge of an answer. The answer being that it is okay to rape in the virtual medium and not unethical in any way, shape, or form, but the students are instead engaging in an exercise in self-censor, a reluctance to broach an extreme form of social etiquette that insists we never explore the topic of rape unless it's in the context of how much women suffer for it and how much men perpetrate it. And Caleb then goes on to say that the video game industry is feeding off of the demons in people's hearts and asks us where society is heading, ascribing a religious connotation as human beings tend to do to uncomfortable truths about the human condition. Caleb knows the answer to the question he poses, at least I think he does, but he decides instead to tuck that away in emotion he decides instead to absolve the human race of its unpleasant fascination with rape by invoking, albeit metaphorically, demonic possession and perversion of man's purity. And he then asks if we, we will choose the righteous path and reject this filth portrayed in these video games and choose, independent of government, coercion, to abandon these violent obsessions we have by boycotting games like Grand Theft Auto. And the college students that he's interviewing make it very clear that this is extremely unlikely to happen. And I think Caleb knows this as well. But again, people like him need a demon to slay. And so he brushes that under the rug and uses it to segue into a war on, you know, the left, right? And I think it's just, it's always fascinating to see how the left and the right uh, implement their methods of coercion and uh, moral posturing. The left is, is more than happy to use the heavy hand of government to sway public opinion. They do it multiple times on multiple occasions. Um, the right, however, employs, I think, a more sinister and arguably more effective technique, and that is the tool of, of social coercion and social proof. Fear-based propaganda designed to foster a feeling that the sky is about to fall at any moment now, and if we don't chase after and oust this or that instant deserving of our moral outrage, the final crack on the heavens will rip open, raining down hellfire and brimstone on humanity as we know it. So, to his credit, unlike Anita Sarkeesian, Caleb does allow ratings on his video. He does allow disagreeing comments. And for that, I commend him, but also not really that much. Because remember, that the right's approach to social control must, by definition, maintain the illusion of choice. It must contain a placebo that cures the suspicion of being manipulated, but it is nonetheless designed to foster shame-based social control and manipulation, and it is grounded in the human need for a struggle. 
a struggle against, in, in the right's case, their great Satan, the left wing, who itself is just as interested in controlling your perceptions reality as well. Caleb finishes by then stating that there is in fact such a thing as virtual morality and opens up a new battlefield in the constant war between the right and left minded, right? And that theater of bat and that theater of war is virtual moral warfare. Now, it's often said when I make these comparisons designed to show similarities between the right and the left that I'm simplifying things to what essentially equates to saying they're 100% the same with no differences whatsoever. This is a straw man. What I attempt to do when making these comparisons is not to display an identical nature between these two political worldviews, but instead identical goals, moral posturing and controlling the male mind and the male sex drive and protecting women above all other things. What these groups, you know, feminist social justice warriors along with the right wing morality police are attempting to do is to disconnect the original reason that we started writing stories in the first place from the video game industry and the comic industry. That is the ability to place ourselves in a character's position in a fictional setting and to empathize and relate to that character even when that character is doing things that we may consider repugnant, even evil, that have always been with us from the great pyramids of Tenochtitlan and its ritual human sacrifice to the Roman Colosseum and is still with us even today. These people are attempting to kill the human sense of wonder because they can't overcome their primitive obsessions and fears, and because they want to prop up this false, inherently good vision of humanity that simply does not exist. Remember that until just a few decades ago, right, we can go ahead and watch for ourselves the spectacle of the Vietnam draft in America in the supposed most free and most supposed civilized nation on earth. Now here's a video of that. The Draft Lottery, a live report on tonight's picking of the birth dates for the draft. Here at Selective Service Headquarters in Washington is CBS News correspondent Roger Mudd. Good evening. It was 29 years ago that the April first and most famous lottery two, number, six, 158, zero. was drawn as the United August States entered third. World War II. Tonight, for the first time in uh, 27 years, the United August States has again third. started a draft lottery. Six, and the famous one. first pick tonight April is September 28. 14th, the first birthday that now is designated 001, which means for 19-year-olds born on September 14th, that beginning uh, in January, local draft boards will induct those men born on September 14th, barring deferments, the next birthday in order, April 24th, and so on down the line this evening. This ceremony, which began at 8 o'clock, is now more than two-thirds through. There are 366 numbers to select, one for each birthday in the year, plus October one for 27th. February 29th, the leap year. The ceremonies began at 8 o'clock under a bill signed just last week by President Nixon. October 27, it had been the two, president's six, plan to four. fly in from all over March the country, 27th. members of his uh, selective service. Now, I find it funny that instead of simply selecting soldiers randomly for conscription and notifying them through the mail uh, that they've been selected, we also felt this need to dress it up in ceremony, right? The detached nature of the entire thing belies the fact that in this macabre little ritual, men were being selected to go and fight and die in war against their will. And knowing that, we watch movies like The Hunger Games and think that, that their ritual human sacrifice is barbarous and could never happen to us. And yet here we are, just a few decades ago, sending men to their deaths and preceding it in this bizarre raffle, this bizarre lottery, right? Not a word, though, from the Anita Sarkeesians of the world about that, though. Because men, you see, do not matter to them. That's what it's really all about. It's about protecting women and using men to do it. That's what Gamergate is. That's what our entire wider society is. So, saying that, allow me then to go on a brief tangent about war. Uh, because in order to understand why the censorship of, of people like Anita Sarkeesian, or the censorship that she tries to visit upon us, uh, works, we need to understand the inner workings of the male and female human animal. Now, in the excellent documentary, Vietnam First Kill, American writer and war correspondent Michael Hurd details his experiences in the Vietnam War, 
uh, taken mainly from his book Dispatches, which are also a chronicling of his time in Vietnam as a war correspondent. Our first introduction to her, and I think everybody should watch this documentary because it's just frankly it's fascinating. Our, our first introduction to her in the film is that of him regaling just what makes war so um, you know fascinating, right? And he says the following, and you really have to see this interview in order to to see his mannerisms. Just just uh, th this war character is just really really a fascinating individual. Uh, he says, "Quote." If war were hell, and only hell, and there were no other colors in the palette, if that was the essence of the experience and all that there was to the experience, I don't think people would continue to make war." End quote. And later on in the film, while he's being interviewed, he shares with us th these comments. He says, quote, There were times where I was just so, he's referring to his time in Vietnam, there were times where I was just so overcome with disgust and horror and that was something I didn't ever want to see again because I'm I'm a you know I'm a nice middle class Jewish boy. I'm not John Wayne Jr. You know, I'm not a blood and guts kind of guy. I just had a very strong attraction to war. And then the interviewer asks him and and was that satisfying? And he says, "Yes. Yes, I was satisfied. It was something that I felt I didn't have to do again. I saw it for a year and that was really enough, probably too much." If I'd been at all smart, I probably would have left after the first operation. I know reporters who did. Then the interviewer asks him, well, why didn't you leave? And then he says, well, because I was into it. I was into it. I was all caught up, you know, in the trip. I believed in it. I didn't believe in the war. But th this is the important part. But I believed in my being there to see this war. And it was interesting. You know, it was not boring. One is never bored. End quote. Now, I've always appreciated such candor from her in this film. He doesn't pretend, he doesn't engage in moral posturing, and he doesn't try to excuse the fact that he was actually attracted to what he was seeing, to the visceral, horrific beauty of war. Now, it should always be noted and understood that what happens in war, things like death, the, you know, the mutilation, you know, the suffering and the destruction, that, that is not a thing of beauty, of course. But I do believe that what war does... And the reason for our fascination with it is because it cleanses our psychological palate, right? Our day-to-day -day worries and concerns are, in war, washed away, right? We are, in witnessing senseless slaughter and death, baptized by a fire of oneness with the universe. We know that on some level, that all of these men dying on these battlefields are the center of their own universe. They are a consciousness tricking himself, slowly but surely, that he is unique, that he is special, that his wants and needs and desires matters. He forgets, until he confronts warfare, that his existence is that of a speck, a nanoscopic particle of flotsam trapped in this inky sea of infinity. War brings that reality crashing back to his forebrain. It reminds him that his little universe, the one he spent his entire existence building in his head, can be erased in an instant by way of lead and shrapnel. And then he sees, and it dawns on him, that society is all too happy to send him via conscription against his will, putting him in this very situation, potentially speaking, and he looks around, and it doesn't take much for him to realize that there's one group of people, namely women, that for whatever reason would never be put in that situation by any society on Earth. There's one group of people that will never be drafted, and never be forced to fight and even die for others, and this has a deep, deep psychological impact on the minds of men. This isn't the first time, though, that they witnessed this dynamic. Because from childhood, of course, they witnessed girls being handled with much more care and compassion than them by even the people tasked with raising them, their parents, the people they would expect the most care and compassion from. But even still, you know, a bit less compassion from mommy and daddy does not shatter a growing male child's universe quite like watching himself and hundreds of thousands of men just like him being legally enslaved and forced to fight other men via the draft who may very well have been enslaved in the same manner. This fosters the male fascination with war and must also foster a distinct psychological realization that his life, according to his society, is relatively cheap. This realization is not limited to conscription. You know, the vast majority of men realize something similar upon 
even entering into adulthood, that if they do not work to support themselves, they will be tossed out into the streets and left to fend for themselves. If they get any handouts at all, both men and women call them bums and parasites and a host of other insults designed to espouse in them the keen understanding that they are filth. Societal detritus that failed some masculinity test they barely understand and never really signed up for. They see that women, to the contrary, are provided for either by doting husband or communal taxpayer who are both intent on ensuring that women be shielded from this same fate. And yet both the homeless man and the doting husband and even the single male taxpayer all know intrinsically that nobody is there to help them. And this truth is an uncomfortable one, as you might expect. Thus, men push it deep down into their subconscious, and they let it foment down there, allowing it to percolate and to mature, and our entire society knows it but dares not speak it aloud. Fortunately, for those of us like myself trying to decipher all of this, language is a funny thing in that no matter how man tries to impose himself onto it, it follows its own course and provides to us clues in our syntax and in our idiosyncrasies that allow us to tease out the true and sometimes ugly nature of the human condition. And this, gentlemen, is what I want to talk about. The subconscious drives of men that allow us to mitigate our fear of death and our fear of male disposability. Right? I would like to introduce to you the concept of terror management theory in hopes of explaining things like uh, things like male mother need. Now, I have to credit not myself, but uh, John the other and Diana Davison for first introducing me to the works of Ernest Becker, who through his work allowed me to arrive at my discovery of this uh, terror management theory, which very much falls in line with the independent conclusions people such as myself and Stardust have arrived at regarding things like male mother need. But uh, the wiki for terror management theory reads as follows, quote, in social psychology, terror management theory proposes a basic psychological conflict that results from having a desire to live, but realizing that death is inevitable. This conflict produces terror and is believed to be unique to human beings. Moreover, the solution to the conflict is also generally unique to humans, that is, culture. According to terror management theory, cultures are symbolic systems that act to provide life with meaning and value. Cultural values, therefore, serve to manage the terror of death by providing life with meaning. The theory was originally proposed by Jeff Greenberg, Sheldon Solomon, and Tom Szynski. You know, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, the simplest examples of the cultural values that manage the terror of death are those that purport to offer literal immortality. Uh, for example, belief in an afterlife or religion. However, terror management theory also argues that other cultural values, including those that are seemingly unrelated to death, offer symbolic immortality. For example, a value of national identity, posterity, cultural perspectives on sex, and human superiority over animals have all been linked to death concerns in some manner. In many cases, these values are thought to offer symbolic immortality by providing the sense that one is a part of something greater that will ultimately outlive the individual, for example, country and lineage or species. Because cultural values determine that which is meaningful, they are also the basis for self-esteem. Terror management theory describes self-esteem as being the personal subjective measure of how well an individual is living up to their cultural values. Like cultural values, self-esteem acts to protect one against the terror of death. However, it functions to provide one's personal life with meaning, while cultural values provide meaning to life in general. Terror management theory is derived from anthropologist Ernest Becker's 1973 Pulitzer Prize winning work of nonfiction, The Denial of Death, in which Becker argues most human action is taken to ignore or avoid the inevitability of death. The terror of absolute annihilation creates such a profound, albeit subconscious, anxiety in people that they spend their lives attempting to make sense of it. On large scales, societies build symbols, laws, and religious meaning systems and cultures and belief systems to explain the significance of life and define what makes certain characteristics, skills, and talents extraordinary, to reward others whom they find exemplify certain attributes and punish or kill others who do not adhere to their cultural worldview. 
Now, before we start digesting some of this stuff, I also wish to append that Wikipedia entry with another article, and it's a lengthy one, so bear with me here, uh, regarding terror management theory titled, quote, Fleeing the Body, a Terror Management Perspective on the Problem of Human Corporeality. In this article, we present a theoretical perspective on the problem of the human body rooted in terror management theory. Terror management theory was developed not to fully explain any particular type of human behavior, but rather to contribute to a full understanding of a wide range of human behaviors that are influenced by the uniquely human knowledge of mortality. Although behavior regarding the body has not been the focus of research on terror management until recently, such behavior seems particularly likely to be affected by terror management needs. Indeed, we suggest that a wide range of both cultural, normal and abnormal human behavior can be better understood by recognizing that body-related problems stem in part from the anxiety engendered by the human knowledge that the body is a vehicle through which life passes on to death. Although it is eminently reasonable for a concern with death to lead people to engage in behavior aimed at preserving their body's physical health, and people certainly do often strive to maintain their health, they typically seem more preoccupied with concerns about how their bodies look, smell, and perform, and compare with cultural standards. Following theorists such as Freud, Rank, Brown, and Becker, we argue that meeting cultural standards concerning the body separates humankind from the rest of the animal kingdom. To elevate our bodies from their flesh and bones reality to a higher plane as objects of beauty, dignity, and even spirituality, Based on this analysis, we offer answers to the following questions. A. Why is the body so often a source of distress and disgust, but also self-esteem and pride? B. Why is human sexuality so often associated with anxiety, romanticism, and spirituality, not to mention its more bizarre manifestations? And C. Why do all cultures place great value on physical appearance, especially the physical appearance of women? And D. In general, why are all cultures compelled to regulate the human body? Now, further down, it talks about some empirical evidence surrounding terror management theory, stating, quote, The majority of the empirical research supporting terror management theory has been focused on two central hypotheses. The mortality salience hypothesis states that if a psychological structure, i.e. a worldview or self-esteem, provides protection from mortality concerns, then reminding people of death should increase their need for that structure. In support of this reasoning, empirical research conducted in seven countries and consisting of more than 75 studies has shown that reminding people of their own death leads them to cling more tenaciously to and increases their defense of their cultural worldviews. Mortality salience has been shown to have several outcomes. Those are more positive evaluations of in-group members and those who praise one's culture, and more negative evaluations of out-group members and those who criticize one's culture. Behavioral approach of in-group members and avoidance of out-group members, as well as increased estimates of social consensus for one's attitudes. Harsher punishment for moral transgressors and increased aggression against those who challenge one's beliefs. Research has also shown that after exposure to mortality salience, participants conform more to recently primed cultural standards and are more reluctant to violate cultural standards and experience greater distress when they do so. Mortality salience has been operationalized with paper and pencil manipulations, usually two open-ended questions asking participants to contemplate their own mortality, but also with fear of death scales, that is, filmed footage of fatal accidents proximity to a funeral home, and subliminal death primes. Moreover, research on terror management processes has shown that the effects of mortality salience are unique to thoughts of death. This is where I disagree with this portion of the uh, hypothesis, but I'll continue on either way. Thoughts of intense physical pain, societal exclusion, meaninglessness, failing an important exam, giving a speech in front of a large audience, paralysis, the death of a loved one, and even the actual failure experience do not produce defensive reactions parallel to reminders of one's own death. Overall, the mortality salience research strongly supports the notion that concerns about death influence a wide range of behaviors directed towards sustaining faith in one's worldview and belief in one's worth in the context of that worldview. The second central terror management hypothesis, and this is one that I tend to agree with more, the anxiety buffer states that if a psychological structure, worldview, or self-esteem provides protection from mortality concerns, 
then strengthening that structure should reduce anxiety in response to stress and specific reminders of death. In support of this hypothesis, momentarily enhanced disposition has been shown to reduce self-reported anxiety after watching a gory video. Harmon Jones found that high self-esteem reduced the effects of mortality salience on defense of the cultural worldview. These studies demonstrate the general anxiety buffering function of self-esteem, as well as the specific role of high self-esteem in quelling concerns about death. Szynski, Greenberg, and Solomon recently reviewed a broad range of evidence showing that whereas proximal defenses involving suppression of death-related thoughts and relatively rational denial of one's vulnerability are employed when thoughts of death are in current focal attention, distal defenses involving strivings for self-esteem and faith in one's worldview are employed when the problem of death is on the fringes of consciousness. That is, when death-related thoughts are highly accessible but outside of current consciousness. Consistent with this view, in a typical mortality salient study, participants fill out an open-ended questionnaire asking them to briefly describe the thoughts and feelings that the thought of your own death arouses in you, and to jot down as specifically as possible what you think will happen to you as you physically die and once you are physically dead. Control participants respond to parallel questions about a neutral topic or an anxiety-provoking topic unrelated to death. After a short delay, participants are then exposed to information that either supports or challenges some aspect of their cultural worldview, and their response to this information is assessed, and shows that proximal defenses emerge immediately after reminders of mortality and are eliminated by delays or distractions, in that distal defenses emerge when there is a delay between reminders of mortality and assessment of defense, after subliminal reminders of death, and whenever death-related thought is highly accessible but outside current for focal attention. So apologies for that very long-winded uh, citation of a study here. But this, I think, is essentially what I've been talking about when I cite things like male mother need. That is, if, if new viewers are wondering what it means, the desire for men to shake off not only the impending nature of their own mortality by repressing it subconsciously, but also the disposable view that their society has of them. Men create systems by which they can mitigate the terrorizing fear that women and society at large do not see them as human beings, but as disposable automatons to be used for the purposes of resource extraction and protection. And I believe that this disposable quality that men have internalized in reaction to society's view of them is what causes them to build institutions and cultural memes revolving around women whom they perceive to have inherent worth. Men see themselves as lacking worth, and thus it is no wonder that male identity is so often associated with shouldering unnecessary burdens and with providing proof of worth and accomplishment. It's why there exists an almost quasi-religious obsession with institutions that need women to operate, institutions such as marriage or the ethereal nuclear family that provides the traditionalist conservative cult with their religious doctrine, etc. Interestingly enough, it is men's fear of death and the manner in which they impose terror management that has allowed the gaming and comic industries to come into being and then to flourish. The gaming and comic industries and anime, etc., are manifestations of the male desire to attain immortality by building fictional worlds replete with complex and oftentimes disturbed but highly interesting characters. Ironically, it is also our society's desire to shelter women from this cognizance of their own mortality and from the disposability reserved for men that has allowed women to mobilize a feminist movement in gaming and in comics designed to sanitize this male world so that it is acceptable for female consumption without triggering their own fear of mortality. And that is why I've implied earlier that the Onita Sarkeesians of the world are conspicuously silent about violence or sexual assault or sexism against male characters in comic books such as the one I mentioned earlier. Because you see, it's not about sexism or even sexual assault in comics or video gaming. It's about women and their fear of men. Women, whether they admit it or not, have a fear of men and they have a fear of male violence or at least the capacity for male violence and they have a fear of men raping them on a deep subconscious level or at least our capacity to rape them on a deep subconscious level. They are terrified of the capacity for male violence and their fear of men is so ingrained into them that it might as well be their fear of mortality. 
So why then do feminists like Anita Sarkeesian seek to repress this under the guise of, quote, sexism? Why then do feminists seek to repress violent themes in video games and other media? Well, I think the proper question is why do feminists seek to repress violence and sexism against women only in video games and other artistic mediums? Seeing as how they have no protestations about the countless images of impossibly buff men, people like in, in Gears of War, for example, Marcus, right? Uh, they have nothing to say about that, and the billions of disposable first-person shooter virtual men that are slaughtered in mass in games like Halo and Call of Duty every day. Why do feminists have problems with only these types of suggestive themes that affect women in video games? Well, I suspect it's many things. Uh, as many of you know, I posit the theory that women and feminists are inherently linked to varying degrees, and both seek to repress male understanding of their darkest desires regarding women. So really, it's a fear of male understanding. If men understand their dark desires regarding women, men, therefore, cannot be controlled by them. If men are not controlled by their desires surrounding women, women cannot control men. And the reason our society is so inundated with claims of sexism and misogyny is because there is a profit to be made in upholding the feminine mystique. If women are seen as fragile creatures that need defense from everything, they solidify their place in society as the perpetually mediocre and the perpetual victim, which is a place of privilege for those that wish to merely coast through life cannibalizing the achievements of others and claiming them as their own, and attaching claims of sexism in the meantime. This is, I suspect, where Gamergate stems from, this desire to repress male inquiry into the feminine, into all of the dark parts of the human condition. It's the desire to uphold the feminine mystique, lest men find out that it's all just a giant, quote, mysterious pile of nothingness that isn't really mysterious at all. An inquiry into the feminine mystique might reveal, first, that women are just as obsessed with violence and rape as they claim men to be, and second, that women are far from the non-violent perpetual victims they would have men believe they are. Thus, it must remain a secret. Women must remain victims, and taboo sexual violence must remain exclusively male, and whenever there is a feminist push into a male space, the presence of sexism, along with the burden of removing it, must lie exclusively at the feet of men. Thus, the conditions for Gamergate are born, which are just conditions that are present any time a male space becomes ripe for female colonization. Because, you, you see, you have to understand, again, that men devise all culture, right? This occurs in multiple steps and all subconsciously. Men develop proto-culture or nascent culture. And in doing so, this requires a foray into the world of fantasy. It requires imagination, right? Imagination. I've always been fascinated by that word, imagination. It's such, it's such an incredibly human word. It, it tells you exactly what it means. It means the visualization of imagery in your head, imagery that possibly doesn't even exist. And it's amazing that nature has devised an arrangement of matter in the form of a human being that is capable of picturing other arrangements of matter within itself, within its own mind. Arrangements of matter that can be completely fictional, or at the very least never before seen or interacted with by this matter. And this matter, in the form of a human being, can bring those arrangements of matter, fictional or unencountered as they may be, to life, into the realm of existence. It's what allows us to fill up spots on the periodic table, and it's what allows us to create worlds we've never seen before. It's imagination. And again, imagination is the manifestation of the male attempt at terror management. Imagination, for the most part, is male. Whether or not imagined things come to fruition, for the most part, is determined by the female and her cultural and societal filters. All imaginative endeavors that the male mind embarks on if they wish to arrive in the mainstream wider society must pass through a female filter, a female form of social acceptance. Gaming, for example, is undergoing this change currently. Gaming came out of male imagination, and it remained in male imagination, rejected by the female tribunal making up modern society, until advances in technology allowed women to see with their own eyes 
what these men who they previously relegated to, uh, you know, social outcasts and social misfits, dorks, it allowed these women to see what these so-called dorks were envisioning and seeing in their mind all along. And then women wanted in. And not only do they want in, but they want everything to be changed so that it doesn't ever scare them, so that it doesn't remind them of violence or worse yet, sexual violence and worse yet, sexual violence against women. You see, women, although our society attempts to shield them as much as possible from mortality salience, have despite this, this one area where they have an extremely potent reminder of their mortality, that is their womb. While men have to actually leave their mark on society via their actions, women are imbued, at least to a degree, with an inherent ability to combat mortality terror, the ability to give birth. Women fear rape because it steals from them, at least potentially speaking, the chance for the woman to choose the expression of her immortality in the form of the male genetics she selects to pass on her immortal DNA with. And thus women, in their quest to maximize safety and pass on their genetics with the most fit male specimen they can find, seek to subconsciously eliminate male genetics they deem faulty that they see as a threat to their womb. This is what men sometimes mistakenly associate as women's hatred of nice guys, you know? Quote, nice guys are to women Genetic failures, they're weirdos, two women, I'm not calling nice guys that, but two women, subconsciously they are. And, and these, quote, nice guys set off their maternal radar in defense and cause an irrational fear of impregnation by these genetic defectives, according to them, of course, subconsciously speaking. And that's why all of these anti-rape initiatives are not directed towards Christian gray types, but are instead directed towards your everyman. Right? And Man Woman Myth said it best when he posted his video that the other man is you. When feminists parade at slut walks right, and say, tell men not to rape, when women advocate for rape shield laws, when they have their little rape shield dramatizations with rape counselors at universities, what they're really saying is to tell men, as in you, that they're afraid of rape from them, from you. Thus, women seek to constantly be leveraging society and government, etc., to have a hypervigilance surrounding the need to protect women from faulty male genetics. But this isn't enough. This isn't enough. Another layer of protection against unwanted male seed is needed in the alpha male brute, the Christian Grey types, right? And we're going to be talking more about this, but for now, this is an extremely long video. We're going to end it here. Thank you for listening, gentlemen.